Hello everybody, today we're going to look at three uniform circular motion problems. I'm going to start off with just some key points reviewing uniform circular motion, what it means, and then we're going to look at the three problems that I have in store for you. The first one is a conical pendulum, just the mass connected to a string going around in a circle. Uh, second one is kind of a variation of that. I have a mass connected to uh, two strings in this case and also connected to a rod. And if I set that to spin, we're going to look at solving uh, for the tension in the strings, for example. And the third one is kind of a variation. Uh, it's kind of a standard uniform circular motion problem, except you have two objects now. There's one that is spinning in a circle on a frictionless table, and the other mass is simply hanging there. So how do we set up the free body diagrams, the equations of motion? And we're gonna, again, we're going to look to solve for the tension in the string and the speed of that puck going around in a circle. All right, like with all my videos, if you like it, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to my channel. Okay, let's get started. All right, so we start with just a quick review, highlighting some of the key points here. Uh, so we have uniform circular motion. Um, the uniform part simply means that the speed, all right, let me make sure I write this speed here, is that the speed must be constant if it's uniform circular motion. Now, it doesn't mean that the velocity is constant. Remember, velocity, if I'm going around in this circle here, imagine I'm going around counterclockwise, the velocity here would be tangent. That's how I would draw the vector. If I continue going around in that circle, this is how I would draw the vector over here and so forth. Over at this point, I would draw it tangent to the curve. However, the length of that vector, the length of that vector, the magnitude of the vector is what the speed is and that would have to be constant. But the velocity is always changing. Right? At this point, it's moving at an angle. At this point, it's moving straight down. So velocity is changing. So what does that mean? That means that you must have an acceleration. My acceleration, guess what? Is depends on how the velocity changes with respect to time. And velocity is always changing. Now, if we're interested in how big the velocity is, typically we call this centripetal acceleration. Right? How big is this vector? This is simply equal to V squared divided by R. V is the speed of the object and R is the radius, right? Because we still have circular part in this title. Okay, so the radius has to be uniform and the speed is also uniform. Now we're interested also in what is the direction of that acceleration. We said there is an acceleration. This is how big it is, but what is the direction? And if the speed is constant, you will find that the direction of the acceleration is always toward the center of the circle. This is also why we typically call it centripetal acceleration. The acceleration has to be toward the center of the circle. Now, if you think about Newton's second law, Newton's second law says, well, if I add up all the forces acting on an object, they must be equal to mass times acceleration. And in this case, I just told you there has to be an acceleration and that acceleration is toward the center of the circle. So guess what? It means we must have a net force acting on the object. Okay, there has to be a net force and the force is always in the same direction as the acceleration. All right, so we're going to look at how do you apply Newton's second law for all of these problems, but they're all going to be characterized with a circle and with an object going around that circle. All right, here's my first problem. We have a conical pendulum. We have a mass over here that's connected to a wire. The wire has a length here of 10 meters long. And the angle that it makes with respect to the vertical right here is 5.5 degrees. Now we have two questions. Find the components of the tension force and also find the acceleration of that mass. All right, so in order to find the tension force, right, that's a force, so we should be thinking about a free body diagram. So let's go ahead and start with some of the forces. So we know we have a weight acting straight down, and we're also going to have a tension force. There is a wire connected to it. That tension force is always along that wire or along the string direction. You can see here we have two vectors that are acting in different directions, so there has to be a net force acting on it. Now the speed of that ball is constant as it goes around the circle, but the velocity changes. And I just told you that means that there has to be an acceleration, and the acceleration here has to be toward the center of the circle. Right? That is the direction of the acceleration. That is also the direction of the net force. 
So this is how you solve these problems now. For circular motion problems, uh, the best thing to do now is to choose a coordinate system. This is what I'm going to choose. I'm going to choose Y to be the vertical direction. And it's always a good idea to have at least one axis toward the direction of the acceleration. In this case, if I consider the mass when it's at this position, I'm going to choose my X coordinate to be toward the center of the circle because I know that's the direction of the acceleration. This is going to simplify applying Newton's second law to this problem. So what you now have to do is you have to break the forces down into components. And the only force I have to worry about here is the tension. So I can break the tension down into a Y component, and there's also going to be a tension in the X component. Now if the angle theta is defined up here, uh, you can also see that this here must also be the angle theta. So how do we write down our tension components? You should now be able to say that Tx, the x component here, uh, should be written as T sine of the angle theta. And we should also have the vertical component of the tension equals to T multiplied by cos of the angle theta. All right, so now we have to apply Newton's laws. So what we have here is in the x direction, in the x direction, there's only one force, right? So again, if I add up all the forces in the x direction, they have to be equal to the mass times the acceleration. All right, in this case, we're going around in a circle. The acceleration is my centripetal acceleration. That is the direction toward the center of the circle. So what does the left-hand side look like? Here, I'm adding all the forces in the x direction. There's only one. So this is easy. This is simply Tx. And I just said I can write Tx as T multiplied by sine of the angle theta. This has to be equal to the mass times the acceleration of the object. Okay, so this will be my equation one. That's one equation that we have. The other direction we can consider now is the vertical direction. In this case, there is no acceleration, right? So if I write down the sum of the forces in the vertical direction along the y-axis, those here have to be equal to zero because there's no acceleration. So that's pretty straightforward. That means that Ty minus mg has to be equal to zero. If you substitute our value of Ty, this is what you get. Uh, T cos of theta minus mg equals to zero. I'll just bring the weight on the other side. So this is what this equation looks like. T cos of the angle theta has to be equal to mg. And we're going to call this equation two. All right, now that I have my two equations, let's have a look at what we know and what we don't know in these equations, right? I don't know the tension that appears in both equations. And I also don't know the acceleration. That is exactly what the question is. Find the tension and also find the acceleration. They're actually asking me for the components, but the components are very easy to find once you know the tension. So let's go back now and think about how we can solve this. Uh, one way you can solve it is to eliminate the tension in one of these equations. So one thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to write a new equation, which is going to be equation 1 divided by equation 2. What that is going to do is it's going to eliminate the tension. So we take equation 1, T sine of theta equals MAC, divided by equation 2. Equation 2 is T cos of the angle theta equals to mg. Now a lot of things simplify here. First of all, the tensions disappear, uh, the masses disappear. Uh, sine divided by cos is simply tangent. Okay, so I can write this as tan of the angle theta. Now if I bring the little g on the other side, I can actually have an expression now for my acceleration. So it's simply g multiplied by tangent of the angle theta. Okay, so this is the equation. So let's go ahead and find what the acceleration of this mass is. So little g is 9.8. And then we're going to have tangent of 5.5 degrees in this case. Uh, substituting in all our numbers, I think I get 0 0.944 uh, meters per second squared. Okay, so that's the first part. All right, the next part is finding the components of the tension force. Well, this is pretty easy because if we go back to, for example, equation one, equation one tells us that the X component of that tension is the mass times the acceleration. And this, I know everything. The mass is 60, the acceleration was 0 0.944, pretty straightforward. Now put that in the calculator. 
uh, 56.6 newtons approximately. Uh, the vertical component now of the tension, Ty. Uh, Ty, again, you just use the second equation, right? Ty is T cos theta. That's actually this guy, Ty. That's simply equal to mg. So again, 60 times 9.8. You see this force, this component is much bigger. Here I get 588 newtons. Now, if you wanted to, you could find the total tension now. The total tension you can find just using either one of these two equations, right? They're going to give you the same answer. So if I actually just wanted to know the full tension, uh, the tension here is equal to the x component of the tension divided by sine of the angle theta. Uh, I put that in the calculator. This is 56.6 sine of 5.5 degrees. Uh, at the end, the tension uh, T uh, gives me approximately 591 newtons. Okay, most of the tension is actually in that vertical component. Very little is in the X component. All right, let's just go back and just have a look at uh, everything here. Make sure that it physically makes sense and that you understand this conical pendulum because it is a really important example. Another question that often comes up with conical pendulum is, what is the speed of this mass going around in a circle? For that one, we go back to our acceleration, right? Remember, we have the acceleration pointing toward the center of the circle, but the magnitude is given by this g sine theta, which we found. But I also told you in the review that the magnitude of a centripetal acceleration, you can always write as v squared over r. Actually, have a look at this equation here. If I bring r on the other side and take the square root, I could take, get an expression for the speed. And let's see if this makes sense. So this is r g tan of theta. All right, let's substitute in our numbers here and see what we get. Um, r tan of theta, so r is the radius, right? It's the radius of this circle, which is here. Okay, so let me think about this. Use a little bit of trigonometry. If we use sine of theta here, sine of theta is equal to r over the total length. Okay, so I, actually I can take this a little bit further. Instead of having r, I can have l sine of theta multiplied by little g multiplied by tangent of the angle theta. Okay, now we could substitute in uh, all the values. So we take square root. I get uh, 10 meters. I get sine of 5.5 uh, uh, multiplied by 9.8 little g multiplied by tangent of 5.5. All right, if I put everything into the calculator here, I think I get 0 0.951 uh, meters per second as my speed. All right, now let's go on to our second problem. All right, this is our second problem. We have a three kilogram mass here that's connected to a rod by two strings. Uh, the geometry is like this. The length of the string is two meters and the points where they make contact are separated by a total distance of three meters. This object is going around in a circle um, at constant speed of five meters per second. We wanna find the tension in each of these strings. So again, like with any uh, physics problem, if they ask you for a force like a tension, you start with a free body diagram. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm actually gonna move this object just to clean up the diagram. So here's the mass. Uh, we have a weight, the weight is acting straight down, mg and we're going to have two tension forces, right? There's a tension force along this guy. I'm gonna call this T1, and there's going to be a tension force T2 uh, acting like this at an angle. Now the angle is going to be the same, and that's because the geometry is the same. So if I define this here to be the angle, uh, the opposite side right here should be half of three meters. So this here should be 1.5 meters also for the other side. Now we could do a little bit of geometry in order to find that. Uh, if I use sine, for example, sine of theta should be equal to 1.5 divided by two, right? The opposite over the hypotenuse. So I should be able to solve that theta right now it gives me approximately uh, 48.6 degrees. Uh, what else can I find? Uh, you can also find the radius, right? The radius of the path is actually this distance right here. Right, that is what I would call R. So the radius you can find using uh, Pythagorean, right? Uh, we'd find that radius has to be equal to the square root of the hypotenuse squared minus uh, one of the other sides, in this case, 1.5 squared. So the radius for this path is approximately 1.32 meters. 
Um, now, all right, so we go ahead and now the next step, we have our free body diagram. I know kind of a lot going on here. What you have to do now is break our forces down into components. So what is going to be the coordinate system that we're going to choose here? Like I said before, it's always best to choose one axis that is toward the center of the circle for these problems. So this is what it's going to look like. Up is Y, toward the center of the circle is X. So now let's break our forces down into components. We don't have anything to do with the weight, but I do have to break down the forces here. This is going to be the vertical component of the tension. This here is the component of the tension that is toward the center of the circle. Now we have to do something similar for T2. T2 also has an X component, I call it T2X. It also has a component, this one is acting down, T2Y. All right, so we've broken all the forces down into components. Now we have to write down Newton's laws of motion for this problem. So let's look at the sum of the forces acting along the X direction. So we have to add them all up. In this case, there's only two forces acting toward the X direction. It's T1X plus T2X. Those are the components of the forces that are acting toward the center of the circle at any point in that trajectory. That must be equal to mass times the acceleration of that object. Let's call this equation one. Uh, for equation two, we're going to look at the sum of the forces in the vertical direction. In this case, we know they must be equal to zero. The mass is not moving up or down. There is no acceleration in that vertical direction. Now, the forces, there are three forces. If I look at the free body diagram here, there is a component of tension T1 acting up, that's positive, minus T2Y acting down, and minus the weight. Now, what I'm going to do here is let's get rid of the X and the Y values, and we can do that again uh, simply using that angle theta. So this is the angle theta. This is also the same angle theta, which I calculated down below. So our equation one ends up looking like this. So T1 uh, cos of the angle theta plus T2 cos of the angle theta has to be equal to MA, M. And what I'm going to do now, instead of writing AC, I'm gonna write the magnitude of that acceleration is V squared divided by R. And I actually know these values, right? I know everything here on the right-hand side. So this is really my equation one. All right, my equation two now can be simplified. This is T1 sine of the angle theta minus T2 sine of the angle theta. And I'll bring the weight here on the other side, zero. This is my equation, oh, not zero, <laughs> oh boy. Let's try that again. I just said bring it on the other side, mg, if I bring it on the other side. All right, so these are my two equations. Now all we have to do is how do we manipulate these in order to find T1 and T2? We have to do a little bit of algebra in order to do that. All right, first thing, the first simplification I would make is probably get rid of these trigonometric functions and bring them on the other side. Remember they're the same angle just because of the way the problem is set up. So actually equation one, you could do like this. I could factor out a cos theta and I can bring cos theta down on the other side. So this becomes R cos theta. This is really my equation one right here. Uh, for equation two, likewise, the angle sine theta is the same. So let's actually get rid of it. So you get T1 minus T2, and this becomes Mg sine of theta. So this is kind of like a new equation two. All right, let me just get rid of those brackets. Those aren't needed. All right, so how do we do this now? One way you can do this to eliminate T2, you notice you have positive T2 here and you have minus T2. If I add up both of these equations, one plus equation two, what you end up doing is you eliminate that. You'll get two times T1 on this side. So you get two T1 equals two. And I'm gonna factor out the mass just because that kind of, it's gonna make the expression a little bit simpler for me. Not too much, but V squared, R cos of theta, and then plus G sine theta. Now the last thing I could do is if I just want T1 by itself, I just bring the two on the other side. All right, so this is my expression for the tension T1. Now how about finding T2? Again, looking at this equation, you could see that T2 
Um, just bring it on this side, bring this term on the other side, you get T1 minus mg sine of theta. Actually, that looks very, very similar to the second term, except it's one half. Anyway, take your time with this step, but T2, you should be able to show that it's the first term is going to be the same. V squared R cos theta. And the second term here, all I do is just switch the sine, G sine of theta. And you get that by simply applying uh, this equation right here. All right, so all you have to do now is substitute in all the numbers. Uh, this can get rather messy, but we know everything in both of these equations. So I'm going to leave that up to you. I'm assuming that I did this correctly. Again, I sometimes I struggle with this myself. Uh, at the end, I ended up getting 62.55, roughly. Again, there could be a little bit of rounding error there. And this one, I got 23.37 newtons. Okay, so that's how I can find the two tension values uh, for this problem. All right, let's go to problem three now. All right, here's our third problem. We have a four kilogram mass that's going around in a circle. It's connected to a string that's connected to another mass down here that is simply suspended, and then it's in equilibrium um, while that first puck moves in a circle. So how do we find the tension? How do we find the forces and the speed of the puck, for example, uh, given this situation? So uh, like with all these problems, first thing we do is a free body diagram. So try to do it here on this figure. We have a tension force acting here and there is a string going through a hole. So that means it's the same tension force that is connected here to this mass M2. Now there is a weight right here. Uh, this has a value of M2 multiplied by little g. For this mass on the tabletop, there are two other forces acting on it. Um, we do have a weight and we do have a normal force. Uh, these are acting like this. This is M1g. They're perpendicular to this tension force. Right? And the normal force is acting from the table on the mass M1, and that's acting straight up. Uh, these two forces are not that interesting because we know that the normal force should be equal to M1g for that problem. What we're really interested in here is the force is acting toward the center of the circle for the mass M1. And uh, for the mass M2, these forces are also in equilibrium because it's not moving. So let's go ahead now, we apply Newton's laws to both of these masses. Okay, so let's first do for mass M1. Again, we choose the direction toward the center of the circle as being the positive forces. So if I add up all the forces acting on that block, um, there's only one, it's simply the tension. So that means it has to accelerate. So you have to have mass times acceleration. And if the speed is constant, uh, what you have is V squared over R for the value of the acceleration. We call this equation one. Um, what about for the mass M2? For the mass M2, there's only two forces acting on it. If you add up all of the forces acting on that mass, we have that the tension acting up minus the weight M2g, right, for the weight. And again, this block here is not accelerating. So that's it. So we have two. All right, so now we go back to the questions. First question is find the tension. Well, we have tension that appears in two equations. So which one do you want to use? Um, you can't really use equation one right now because we actually don't know the speed that the uh, puck M1 is moving. We know the mass M1. Now, let me add that to this equation. Uh, we also know the radius is 1.2 meters, but we don't know the speed. So forget about using equation one. It's very easy to calculate the tension using equation two. So for our first problem, the tension is simply equal to the weight of object two. Uh, in this case here, the mass was two kilograms. A uh, little g is 9.8. So that means that our tension is 19.6 newtons. All right, what about the radial force now acting on the puck? The radial force is the force acting toward the center of the circle. Well, guess what? There is only one force acting toward the center of the circle. This is kind of a trick question. It's T. So T is the radial force, and that is also 19.6 newtons. All right, our final problem says, what is the speed of this puck? How fast is it moving? Again, now we go back to equation one. We know the tension now in this case. All you have to do is do the algebra just to isolate V by itself. So I start by bringing the radius over, 
actually let's just write it all out first. You have m1 uh, v squared divided by the radius equals to the tension. All right, so this is what it looks like. So you have v squared, bring r on the other side, and divide by mass m1. And at the end, you have to take the square root of both sides. That is going to give me my expression for the speed. T times the radius divided by m1. All right, guess what? Uh, we know all the values here. Just substitute and get a final answer. 19.6, the radius is 1.2. The mass m1, now be careful, this one here is four kilograms. All right, put everything in the calculator at the end. I think I got 2.42 meters per second. Um, one thing I wanna do is let's look at this equation here in a little bit more detail, just to make sure that this makes sense. Um, if I substitute the value of the tension, right, the tension I also found was m2g. All right, so actually, if you substitute T for M2G, this is what it looks like. All right, so have a look at what happens, right? If I had a heavier mass, right, what if M2 was bigger? In order for this object to remain in equilibrium, it means that the speed of this puck at the top would have to be bigger, okay? If the speed is less, guess what? This object is just not going to be in equilibrium anymore, and it's going to spiral down. Okay, so it's really only for this one speed that you're going to have this condition of equilibrium. All right, that's it for me, folks. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you understood something about uniform circular motion problems.